Michael. And I know Michael much longer than anybody else in the room. So somehow uh, he learned small talk in a group I did 24 years ago at University of Dortmund. And then he moved on to Magdeburg, and he only lives 40, 40 kilometers or 50 from where I am, but we only meet in the US. <laughs> <laughs> or in Lugano or places like that. So Miguel is going to speak about the topic also. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm even more nervous than I usually are. Uh, and before talks, because this is the very first talk I'm actually doing on, on Sophie, doing in Sophie, so we should be lucky. Um, Sophie, um, our very modest motto is um, the future of reading, and um, you, you'll see why, why we have this motto and um, kind of this high ambition. So we believe we will transform the way we go about reading and writing especially in screen-based environments. So that's the main goal of Sophie. That's always, you need to keep that in mind. Um, Sophie has capabilities for um, using it for paper output or PDF output or, or other forms, but the main goal of Sophie really is the screen. Um, Sophie is a project of the Institute for the Future of the Book. So for people who are interested in that, can go to their website and look at what they are doing. So that institute is hosted by um, the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. The uh, initial funding for SOFI, um, which started in about 2004, although I kind of started talking to Stephen Riggins and Bob Stein about that project about a year earlier already, um, was provided by the Mellon Foundation. They have this huge effort to um, bring open source software to higher education, especially universities. And Sophie was sort of a latecomer, actually one of the smaller projects. But we still got funding for about two years uh, for a group of people. Um, the initial group was um, John McIntosh, who will we'll also say a few words later, uh, Tim Rowledge, um, myself, and Bernd Hecker, also from Kambara, and Stephen Riggins, um, who is based in Portland. Um, additional funding later came from McCarthy in USC, and the whole project is now hosted at USC in Los Angeles. So when you go, when you go to the website and download Sophie, you can do it there. Um, don't get me started with the layout and the looks of the website, but well, at least you can read them. But there's some documentation up there you can download the the latest versions, um, etc. The mailing lists, unfortunately, are down right now because we moved to a new server and we can figure out their mix all settings, so we need to be a bit patient. So the background on Sophie is, um, goes back about 15 years by now, let's say. Um, we began with um, Bob Stein and his company called Voyager. Um, Early on, based in Santa Monica, later in New York, they did the very first multimedia productions using um, laser video discs, the first Macintosh with CD ROMs, etc., etc. So they did products like uh, Who Built America, um, they also had like the Criterion Collection and others. And most of their stuff was done in HyperCard, um, which really means they used kind of the HyperCard engine and then haptic beyond the because what they tried to do was pushing the limits far and further than this technology would really allow. And <clears throat> so Bob Stein actually ended up, um, instead of, well, besides producing all his titles, also producing his own toolkits. So um, they went through several um, iterations over the years, <laughs> and kind of the first being the, what was called the expanded um, book toolkit, um, later, they did a complete new project from scratch in C++, which was called TK3, Toolkit 3, and it's hosted by Night Kitchens, um, or Night Kitchen, nightkitchen.com. Unfortunately, the website seems to be down, so I'm not sure what's up there. And then when we started Sophie, uh, we called it TK4, Toolkit 4, and then later came up with a better name to kind of um, enforce 
replaced with the cotton or wood and making new philosophy, etc. Um, so what we had to look at when we started out was, um, besides kind of what TP3 did and the other toolkits, was what are the existing models, what can we learn, uh, what, what we don't want, um, or, or what we need beyond what's currently there. So one very popular model is the PDF-based model. But it's basically printing a document to the screen. Um, Adobe has added a couple of capabilities to PDF, but PDF basically is still static content, more or less. Uh, and you can do forums and all kinds of stuff, but that's really more on, on the enterprise side and in data entry. It's not really a multimedia. Another uh, model is markup languages, HTML, XML, community. And but that really has the downside of programming the content. So although there are tools that, uh, that you can use to edit HTML, if somebody ever has tried to build a sort of interactive website with media, um, no sorry, tool support is really kind of limited and makes it really hard. On top of all the fun with different browser versions that you have on the seven models. And um, Another thing is with the existing models, it's difficult to mix, and especially we mix. We've got an enormous surge in kind of media culture going towards we mix. So one thing is to create the content, but a huge thing is to we mix. If it's DJs, or if you've got the YouTube videos where they mix stuff together, or, or the collages, etc. So a lot of that is really trying to create interactive content. <clears throat> so, one of the main goals of Sophie is to be media agnostic. So, books can, base, can be based on the different media and also on time. So, with text, for instance, we have import for normal text files, RTF, rich text, copy and paste, so you can select something in the web browser and paste it with formatting um, into Sophie. We have support for all kinds of image files. PNG, JPEG, PNG, TIFF, probably a few others I mean, I'm not aware of right now. Um, and with video and also with audio, basically you can play anything QuickTime does. Um, at least on Windows and Mac. So the problem with Linux, or for instance the old PC is that we don't have QuickTime there. And um, Sophie's based on, on Squeak, and Squeak is supposed to be the media system, but actually has relatively limited media support. Um, so in video it's some wacky MPEG-1 format that it actually supports. Um, and with the current, with, with the recent GStreamer work that John also worked on, um, that is getting better um, to have platform of independent media support. Now a bit um, about the architecture. Um, after kind of listing all these different um, goals and things we want to do with Sophie. Um, it was really hard to come up with an architecture. So from the first two years, um, we spent basically one year just working on the architecture, brainstorming, doing prototypes, and have something running, um, as funny as it might sound, basically without a UI. So the first version of Sophie, so to say, after one year, it was basically without a UI. Um, so, basically, what we tried to do is to, a bit like Smalltalk does, right? Smalltalk is based on only a handful of principles and everything else kind of derives from that in, in the combination and, um, and grows from there. So, we tried to break down everything into small components that then kind of make up the power of Sophie. So we have um, kind of what we have about books is we have pages, and those are in what we call spines, like in a book. So we have a sequence of pages. That's kind of the reference to a book. But as you can see, there's spine and spines. So a book can actually have several spines that allows you to have like alternate narratives and things like that um, to, to explore and search between. Um, 
these pages are to a certain extent ephemeral. So um, you can create explicitly you can create pages, but most of the time they're actually created as an artifact of compositing uh, sort of the layout definition you did with the content. So the pages are based on templates and frames and um, the content is put into content trees. So actually the, the text uh, and other, other things in the text flow are held in a tree hierarchy, uh, which has some interesting properties uh, and also some interesting challenges. As you find. Editing trees is uh, an interesting algorithm challenge. And then everything is basically controlled by styles. So, um, and that's sort of already the core of, of something. That's what, what a lot of the other things derive from. Then all the resources we deal with, images, and audio, etc., um, is kept in media files and together with the other components in, in objects. And John is going to say a couple of words about that in a minute. And then um, with the pages, we will generate display pages and the timelines we can control all that um, and, and make it uh, time dependent. So another aspect of Sophie, and that's one of the separations that the cuts will be, what I just described is the core architecture. So basically that defines what the Sophie group is. It does not define what the Sophie UI or even the application is. So basically with that core architecture, um, you could build a completely different system that would still be a Sophie group. So you could build um, a simple notepad system, or you could build a PowerPoint cloud, or whatever. As long as it's using that Sophie core, Will be a software. Um, so we separated out the application architecture. And kind of the interface to the core architecture is what you see on the top, the book editor. And um, the book editor gave, basically defines the API to manipulate the book, to create stuff, to delete stuff, to move stuff around. That all goes through the book editor. So if someone writes an application, even if we change the core application, um, they don't have to worry about that. So they don't have to deal with all the um, interesting problems in combining the content with the compositors, and editing the trees, that's all going through the book editor. Um, <coughs> so, and then, the application itself is split up into a command processor that handles all the undo, redo, um, menus, the UI definition, and then the, the real um, application code is in uh, what we call extensions. So even the basic editing, like typing, cursor, left, right, is already in the text extension. So basically, if you throw away the extension, you don't have an application. Um, so that way, um, as I said before, you can swap this out completely and change the editing behavior to something, I don't know, for instance, to a multi-touch interface, if you think of the iPhone or, or other tablet machines, um, and then you can do that in, in a very isolated manner. And um, then on, for the UI, we actually use, um, to define the UI, Zool, or a slight variant of Zool that's also used for Firefox extensions, and then we skin the whole thing using CSS files. <coughs> So I would like to have John uh, work on the uh, storage so we can uh, run that the kind of architecture for it. Hi, I'm John McIntosh. So actually I started work with Sophie, I guess four years ago when the project first kicked off and um, became responsible as the uh, story czar of the project. And, the other developers into submission not to write magic files and so forth. Um, so one of the first decisions that we made was is that we had these URIs which are different than URLs. You'll have to ask Michael the difference. Um, but really the issue was is that we wanted to have a, a reference to media or to objects in the system um, 
that was not a file-based kind of thing because, of course, we were hosting it on Mac, Windows, and Linux machines. And then, of course, we realized that here on the file or HTTP or some other type of indicator, and then really, when you want to get at the data, you actually just ask the URI subclass for a read stream or a write stream. And then you basically um, separate that functionality off into the URI subclasses. And your application just all it knows is it sends a message to say it wants the read stream when it has to be able to get the data. And so actually the URIs can be relative to the book or to a fixed location. And then if they're relative to the book, then there's different places in the book substructure or uh, the fact we can embed books within books. Um, so it made it very flexible for, for storing the media. We also then had to address the issue of the fact that the URI had to be UTF-8 and HTTP-8 coded aware. Um, when we started getting to testing and we get people from Iceland submit us books with media, they're using uh, folder names after their favorite city and um, those are not uh, English characters. decided was is that we stored all our data as XML. One of the, the key um, cornerstones in the project was is the whole issue of um, books today, PDFs today are all in this binary format. And history has shown that Microsoft, if you take a 25 year old Microsoft document, good luck in opening it today. So one of the mandates for the project was is how do you build a system where I can create a book, Yet a hundred years from today, someone's going to be able to take that book and open it up in Sophie uh, 21,002 or something like that. Um, so part of that key was to um, store it in XML. And then also the model we used, um, because I had a lot of time, four years, actually probably going like six or seven years of overtime, um, was that we actually versioned the XML. So as the project progressed, we would actually um, set up the architecture so that you could read version from January of 05, and then when you saved it, it would write it out in the version for January of 08. And then also, um, the objects that are being written out, I don't actually update anything in place. When the save happens, I create new um, versions of the, of the objects that are being stored. And that was so that um, we have this idea that you could roll back of, uh, across a save uh, checkpoint. Now, we never have really gotten into implementing that, but the infrastructure to support that is in the uh, SOPI storage model. Um, I'll just give an example of the XML. We don't have any of the data definitions because it takes time and energy and someone has funding to do that, that'd be great. Some of the interesting things in here are these uh, fact that UTF-8, another thing, we had people from other countries start building books, so we had to make sure that they could um, input into Squeak and various language, Unicode languages, and that we would save that data and then be able to read it. Um, you notice this indent write, is this magic number, um, those are what we call C twips, and uh, Michael, maybe should you should explain. Yeah, 128th of a twip. So it's like I don't know, but topography is wonderful and complex. But really, what it let us do is is have an extremely high accuracy on the placement of of uh, textual data, because not only do we have people interested in this product for doing something like their <coughs> Letter for their uh, scout hall or, or a polling team, etc. We have the publishing industry where it's really, you know, the character has to go here, and I get my uh, 
magnifying glass out and look very carefully at how it fits all aligned. The interesting property about C tips is Matus is something Windows use, uses, I think it's a 4000 uh, an inch or something. The C tips actually, uh, by using integers, um, scales into both metric and imperial values. So we didn't have to describe some of these imperial metrics. So that's one of the So, plus also when we had anything that related to measurement, if we didn't have a really big number like that, you had like a seven, you knew you had forgotten a conversion. Uh, so when, when you try to render a font at, at seven, I think there's an example up there with a font size, yeah, three o four eight o. So if you set like the font size is twelve, you get this like dot. <laughs> but uh, but this is an example I think of a paragraph. It's a paragraph style. The other thing you notice here is this parent is over context. So in the architecture, it basically goes off to. Um, a resolver that uh, figures out it's the style, and then there's this UUID, which then it goes and looks, past the story subsystem that it wants the object associated with that UUID, and then it has to link up, you know, it actually has to take this XNOM and build um, a graph of objects, which is the actual um, growth structure. Um, we had a lot of fun with that because there were issues where uh, Sometimes people would forget to do the resolver context and they would end up inlining an object and then they would get two objects that are identical and then depending on how they interacted with them, you'd end up with two versions of them and then that was of course a bug. Very hard to figure out, but um, that was a fairly rare case, fortunately. So, as I mentioned, um, in terms of the book storage, it's really abstracted into a manager and storage. And we ended up having many different subclasses. We, we actually evolved how the books were stored as we worked through um, about the way that we thought it should work versus what the uh, end users told us to observe versus we were attempting to host Sophie on the one laptop per child. And so they had some um, other restrictions in terms of, of the fact they had a compressed file system. So um, we basically have a, a Mac Windows folder structure which sets all the XML into a single file. We had a flat folder which we were using to host on Apache servers. Or the fact that you can like take the folder structure and uh, gzip it and give that to someone and then you can open it direct in selfie because we can read the gzip structure. And of course, as I mentioned, the old PC optimization. So there's a number of subclasses here to support all of that. I don't know if you can read, but you can see where it says published. We also have, yes. And it doesn't have these kinds of different storage formats and tied to specific platforms conflict with the wanting to be able to read this stuff in a hundred years school? Um, it's, it's basically, um, the content basically is the same um, across all these formats. So you always have data center files, files, just how they are packaged. And this is, I mean, as you can probably guess, part of that is, is sort of thrown into the project, always trying to find the right format, or the kind of capture backwards and compatibility. So one of the reasons we have, have this um, folder structure is because we deal with media, and people are putting 50 megabyte videos being larger into the book, you don't really want to stuff that into a zip file because you can't play it the zip file, or at least we haven't found a way to do it. Mm -hmm. So you would need to extract it first, and then it's not in the best way to it. And, and that's one of the things we've struggled with, and we haven't really found the perfect solution, <coughs> so we're kind of trying this combination of things. And, um, that's one of the things we are um, going to revisit, sort of now that we Yeah, you'll notice actually here there's like folder, um, file-based ones, and then there's also network-based ones, for example. Um, but in reality, the interesting thing with this is that you could open up a network-based block, and then when you save it, you could save it to a different folder. 
format. So it was very easy to convert one format to another, which is to save as operation. So it's all it's all very transparent to the um, to the user. And actually, Michael just alluded to the folder structure. So this folder structure on the Macintosh, because you can um, indicate a folder as a package, and then it appears as a, a document um, on the Mac, which the Mac uses really like. And you'll find actually many things in the Mac are packages versus <coughs> files. But if this is a little confusing to Windows users or Unix users because they end up with this folder structure, and um, they're not quite sure what to do with it. So we had to add this uh, readme file here, which I chopped the name off a bit, but it says like, don't remove, rename or remove the files, because we had people that would go in and say, I don't know what that file is, so I'll just delete it. And then when they go to open their book, we would say, well, it looked like a book, but it's not really a book. And then they would complain, and we'd say, what did you do? Well, they took the junk out that was in the folder. Well, that was your book, so <laughs> yeah. don't do that. But also this contents thing, which um, Michael alluded to, uh, you'll see there's three movies in here, and an M um, MP3. Those are actually UUID encoded names um, for the object. And so when, in Sophie, that you import something, we create a UUID for that object, uh, and then we, of course, then create the name, um, and stuff it in the contents folder so that QuickTime can actually get at the data. We also found from, um, I guess for debugging purposes, we could get some of our users to say, well, just go in and delete all the, the movies out of your contents folder and then send us the book. So they might have like a 100 meg, uh, 100 megs book, which is all movies and sound and stuff, but they only might have um, 100K of actual textual book data and that was the part that we were interested in. So they could go in and strip out that stuff and zip up the book and send it to us, and we didn't have to endure the issue of how do you move a 100 meg file around an email. Um, also, there's like a, this, uh, this preview JPEG, which is a magic JPEG that we use in OSX for a uh, quick look. If you're familiar with that, you can hit the space bar, and it shows the first page of your, of your selfie book. And also an external XML file, the Sophie book, um, SPBM, which is XML data describing um, the block of the book, the copyright, when it was created, last modified, and stuff like that. We looked at, that was the ability for external programs to quickly be able to look and see um, you know, what they were looking at without having to get into the, into the Sophie book SPB, which is the zip. Um, document that contains all the XML. In terms of the media, one of the, the I guess, criteria that I, I put together when the project began is that um, media typically is imported unless you link to it. So when you uh, drag and drop media, because you can drag and drop from a uh, browser or from the file system, um, you know, or you can enter a URI by typing it into an input field. There is the option for you to be able to actually choose to import it into the book or retain the URI in question. So some um, Sophie books, for example, they'll refer to web pages or um, images on web pages they've stolen. Uh, lots of lots of content copying and. Uh, not much in regard to copyright laws in this product, I'm afraid, from people working with the system. Actually, the ability to link to media instead of importing that into the book um, gets around a lot of the copyright issues. So as long as you link to something that's on the web, you're not <coughs> kind of stealing it. So, it's, I mean, we're not lawyers, but basically that helps to, to make it easier to do this remix and this media assembly that, that Sophie is. Yeah, because uh, QuickTime does streaming over the internet, people link to um, all sorts of non-flash based media. People typing in YouTube something or other and trying to import it was a very favorite thing for the teenagers that use this product to do, but we don't, uh, we're not able to 
read and understand Flash. So that action always fails. Um, we also, at publish time, there's an opportunity for us to do something with the media. We don't do that. I'm not sure Michael talked about publishing. There is this publish process that you go through for the book where you convert it to a read-only format. Um, and there are opportunities to do things in there. Also, we, when you import um, to media, we create an audit trail, always the originating your eye. And then also, if you copy media between Sophie books, because you can open. In this example, actually, see, he has actually two Sophie books open here in the Sophie application. And it's really easy to drag and drop or copy paste media between Sophie books. And when he does that, we actually record um, where the media came from. So there's a trail of, of ownership in the product. Also, then, I guess in the publishing, we do uh, remove, compact some of the versioning that we did in the XML and make the book read only. And we also bring in subbooks if that's what the user wants to do. I don't, do you have an example of subbooks? Mm -hmm. No, no, we should not. Okay. They were really painful. Um, I actually wrote um, 100 or so S units to test the storage system and then subclass that and then um, repeating it for non folder, folder, and memory based books. Uh, so running those S units takes about 15 minutes. Um, but out of that, we actually ended up not having problems with the storage system um, creating books that were unreadable. Um, because you know our most important task was ensuring that if you save the book, you'd be able to read it the next day. Um, I don't think we ever had a case where um, someone had a problem where they could never read their book again. We, and throughout the project, we um, encounter um, issues um, where different components of Sophie would fail to um, save some of their data or something, and so it never would actually get saved. Um, out into the book, and then of course you start up and they would look for something and they couldn't find it. But we, we fixed, uh, throughout the project, I think we fixed most of the books, um, because we could go into the XML and, and uh, change the XML by hand and get the book up and running. Um, you know, I alluded to the whole issue of the content that's referenced versus embedded. That was another key issue. And at this point, I think one of the hurdles is, is that we would like to go back and there's pockets of like book storage management that have linked out of the storage subsystem into, into the UI or other parts of Sophie um, that need to go back into the storage subsystem so that that responsibility doesn't belong to highlighted markers, for example, uh, which was, um, we must have rewritten highlighted markers about four times, maybe it was six times, I'm sure. So it sounds easy, but uh, it, it wasn't. So I'll turn this back to my phone. It's going to go back to that. Thank you, John. Um, yeah, that was one of the, the challenges throughout the project, and still is, that when we started out, and we thought, oh, we got two years and five people, and it's really great. And, uh, we had no idea what we got ourselves into. Um, and because kind of demands and requirements were changing while we were developing the projects. We were, oh, you can do this? Then maybe you can also do this. And it's kind of a project exploded as, as it often happens. Um, a quick look at the Sophie UI. Um, I was really afraid that it would never fill 45 minutes, not run out of time. Um, <clears throat> so the Sophie UI, I'll do a very quick demo just to give you an overlook. Um, basically on the left side, you got all the contents of the book out and explain that in the real domain. You can then edit the book um, and in the middle in the workspace you see the timeline that sticking up from below. And on the right you got all your resources, templates, frames, etc. So it's kind of this um, very clear structure. Um, and one thing we have, and it's kind of you can sort of see it, is when you look at this um, this um, partial screenshot, then here's the cursor. And when you type and stop typing, what happens is that um, tables pop up. 
similar to um, and we got the idea from from eToys about that. So basically, where you are, you get sort of the action on it and what you can do. So we hardly, although you see pull down menus at the top, we have no no context menu, and basically we could get rid of the pull down menus. Um, and the rest all works through drag and drop or through these headlines. So basically what you see here, it's a little hard to see on this resolution. The C is for the character style, the, the other one is for the paragraph style, and then this anchor chain thing is for defining rings. And when you click on one of these buttons, in this case the paragraph style button, uh, something that we call a HUD head up display opens. And as you can see there, there's no OK and cancel. So we don't have OK and cancel in the system almost at all. There are very few places where we have that. And so basically, everything you do is immediately applied, but you can always undo it. Um, hopefully, if you don't run into that. Because <coughs> getting undo so consistent throughout the system turned out to be really hard, as some of you probably know when you really tried that. Another thing that we did, this again, when you, when you look, this is the paragraph style HUD. This is also the paragraph style HUD. So what we did is kind of divide up all these millions of functions that we have with uh, what the people call basic text editing, but what they meant was InDesign. Um, and normal users use 20% of that. So that the 20 rule you have in many applications. So basically, we put what we think 80% of the users use into that first level HUD. And then when you want to go uh, and use more sophisticated features, you, you open that HUD in, in successive steps so you're not overwhelmed by these huge dialogues and tap interfaces with all these options. But for your normal work, you're very quick and you have this really um, simple interface to be open. Um, so this is another example of the link up in that case where you find actions and how anything works, etc. So a quick demo. Really, really quick one. So you got the uh, um, you can just simply create a new book. And you have the new book. Um, open the flap up here. So you see a couple of frames so I can Flow frame. flow frame is a frame that can continue on in other frames, whereas a non-flow frame kind of keeps the, the text in, in one location. And so now I can pull in resources. I can also just simply type. And as I said, Sophie's mainly used that as an assembly tool. So I just drag in an LTF text and it's imported. And let me switch to the pages. And now you see the pages that are generated here. Um, from the text. And now I can also kind of take the other resources here and uh, import them. <coughs> it takes a little while, but it puts it in, in the book. So now we have all the resources in the book that we want to work with. So now I can basically drag out um, these images so um, we can move them on the page rotate them, resize them, etc. And for instance, I can set the, uh, the wrap to off, so the text flows through the image, and I can push the image to the back, and um, change the opacity. Um, so, so I have all the abilities to, to do all these graphical manipulations. Um, I could also um, um, can, let's go to another page, drag in a different image, and then if I rotate it, we actually that contour flow um, around the image, <coughs> um, and, and things like that. Another thing I can do is, um, what I mentioned earlier, is, is these action links, and I've actually used them in the presentation. So I can basically say, um, on this frame, top of this frame, 
uh, on the sleeve. So now we have to go into chest mode. Now we have to click on the sleeve so to show us that. Um, so you do, very simply, you can build these interactive things. You can start movies and timelines from these things so you put somewhere uh, stuff kicks off. And um, you can also drag in um, movies. Um, as I mentioned before, those are played um, through QuickTime. <coughs> you can show a simple controller. Um, so if you need to play the movie if I want to. And um, right now we are playing um, basically QuickTime renders into a form, and then we take the form and flip it through Squeak onto. I don't know if you guys know that from Marshall, that's actually one of my favorite commercials. Um, and uh, we're blending it to the screen, so right now we can't really do like HTTP uh, movies um, because the, the bandwidth just wouldn't be enough. So that, that's one of the things we need to work on. Um, okay, this is a commercial for French cars. So, um, the only one that's about is the crash test. So this is <laughs> this is like a really really quick quick demo. Uh, here you can see the hearts that kind of fold open with more and more options. But in um, the usual case, it's really to show you <coughs> what you're working with. And then you have styles that you can save to, just like you can do with Word or any other program, you can plug them, um, etc. So, th so there are millions of things here um, that are in Sophie that, that you can do So this is really just something to give you a quick impression. Um, let's close this book. Um, so one of the interesting things here is, um, as I said before, that you can take, for instance, movies and um, put them on the page and then basically put stuff on top of it because we have the full control in the overlay lighting. So you can see that. Oh. Oh, it's demo live for you. Yeah, the movie doesn't start. So um, just to show you a couple of things that users actually have done using Sophie. And this is the Sophie Reader. The reason why I did the presentation kind of in this authoring environment was because I made the mistake and used the newest development environment to build it, and then realizing that the currently deployed reader can't read the newest format yet. Um, so I had to go back to my development environment. <laughs> yeah, never do that, I know. That's, that's Murphy for you. Um, so that's a book that was built um, during during a workshop at um, at USC, um, kind of about um, art and, and humanism and cinema. So that's part of this whole um, um, USC hosting the future of the book and the Edinburgh Institute for Media, etc. So they actually built sort of a Table of contents and then put annotations on all the images, um, so you, you always get an explanation that you're dealing with. Um, one point, like here, go over. They show like the um, the old image of that house. And then, um, The other one, which I don't really know what this all is supposed to mean, but um, they're basically taking this text and then um, kind of overlaying um, certain things and putting annotations on to explain what's going on. 
So, so this is one of the things that, that um, John mentioned, the books within books and, and linked to books. So you basically can, can package these extra explanations with multiple um, pages and separate spine together with the original book. So you get this, this web of explanations and, and, and like narratives. One interesting book is when the wife of one of the future people who he is uh, working at the library, so she did this collection of, of cookbooks and, and put them into a selfie book. <coughs> and then basically for every book explains uh, what it's about, where it comes from, what, what the background is. Um, okay, let's see that. Yeah, I thought I would run out of time. Um, <coughs> This book here, I mean, Sophie, um, we actually have a proof of concept um, exporter that will export this to the web. So um, this is the same Sophie book. It's been exported and it works the same way in the browser without a plugin. So it's not this new plugin. So you can basically um, build your interactive websites and export them uh, and have them on the web page without dealing with the so, as time has run out, uh, I will continue to talk with this. Thank you. Maybe we have time for one or two questions. Uh, you said that Sophie was the future of reading. But what about the future of writing? <laughs> Well, that, that's actually an interesting, um, I mean, just, just to um, reinforce this, we are the developers, the visionaries of the Bob Stein and Future of the Book Guys, so they would be much more suited to answer that question. But it's really about exploring, um, I mean, reading and writing goes together, so we actually had the USC workshop, people started out basically using the usual way of writing, <coughs> And then while getting into Sophie and seeing what they could do, they realized they had to change their style of writing and the way they think about books. So it's, it's, it's a very strongly coupled issue. But, um, that's what the Institute is for. They're trying to figure out these, these questions or the answers. Um, I've been reading recently Apple resolution independence for uh, whatever programs you create. Is that something that will have any effect on you, or is it something you care about at this point? Are you, are you, all, are you already resolution independent? Um, sort of. Okay. So everything within Sophie is, is as we repeatedly said, in sequence. And that's related to points, so that's a fraction of a point. Basically what we do right now is a point is a pixel which of course is wrong on most screens. But because we have the, um, we need some UI support for making the author aware that do you want to have it true to the pixel? Like, do you enforce pixel equals point? Or do you want to have the book this size? Regardless if it's on a 30 inch screen with 160 DPI or on a 72 DPI screen, whatever, I mean, it will be scale. So, um, of course, if you have pixel images, you need to scale them, but fonts, etc., everything is vector-based. So we, we also use the Cairo drawing library to draw with, with the Rome plugin screen. And um, so, so we can scale this stuff. We, it's already sort of prepared to do it. Does your architecture support uh, external renderers? Like right now you have QuickTime, but not Flash, I think I heard you say. Is it possible to write a renderer that would be able to be plugged into Sophie? Um, yes and no. I mean, yeah, John can probably answer. I can answer that. Um, the, the movie playback logic is, a, is another uh, whole subclass. And so when you get a media object in and you're asked to play it, um, there's a dispatcher that figures out who's the most appropriate renderer to do that action. <coughs> and then there's an abstract class. And, and under that, where 
um, the appropriate plug-in or the squeak plug-in or quick time or a failure case. We actually have a failure case where we put up a media object and to say we were unable to play your movie or, or play your audio kind of thing. Um, like, for example, we do that when people drag in um, their favorite uh, iTunes uh, track, which you know is protected, and then they try to distribute it to their friend, and of course we can't play it. So then we let them know. We say, uh, video not file, file not found or is unreadable kind of thing. So, so that would answer your question, I think. Um, you know, if you know of a flash player that doesn't uh, compete on someone's intellectual property that we could use, then <laughs> you can integrate it. I mean, John integrated the G-strings, so I mean, that's sort of the, the proof that, that we can do that. Um, actually, I'm going to talk at ESOG on the G-stringer stuff on Monday, I think, about this time in the afternoon, um, in August. Um, G-stringer is a, a media streaming um, open source GPL um, system that lets you basically uh, uh, connect via data diagram um, these plugins that read media, translate media, interpret, decode, whatever. And so, um, uh, Viewpoint Research paid me in April to um, build a squeak um, interface for that uh, so that they could um, post that on the old PC. And um, I believe Quack is actually in the middle of uh, taking that work and um, building the Windows uh, version of it. Um, it's not really it's not available on OS X because of the issues with installing the base uh, system. But if someone, some Unix person, wants to figure that out, then I'd be glad to work with them in getting that to work on 